seems to me that when we talk about the Camino Real, the one phrase that always comes up uh, in my mind is que todos somos primos. We're all cousins. Uh, and it's, it's very easy uh, to, to fall into that. And then you find out as you do uh, genealogies, and you look at the genealogy in the exhibit area back here, and some of you are going to begin to identify either with the Hubbles or you're going to identify with some of the people uh, whose names are on those walls. Todos Somos Primos is uh, perhaps one of the largest themes of the Camino Real, primarily because the Camino Real was an immigration route. And indeed, it was more than an immigration route. It was a trade route. It was a route which introduced Western civilization into this part of the world. But it was a two-way street because the Camino Real itself is an indigenous route. It's made up of a series of Indian trails coming up from the Valley of Mexico from one valley to the next and modified in many, many different ways as it moves forward and as it moves people. Along the Camino Real came some of the ancestors, the people sitting in here. I can tell you that uh, my ancestors, uh, the Martinezes, came up with Oñate and probably walked the trail with your ancestors. Uh, it's not a far-fetched idea. I think it's very, very true because in the office that, that I run at the University of New Mexico, we had two people who I can tell you walked whose ancestors walked with my ancestor on that first trip of the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. As a conduit of Western Civ, what comes up the Camino Real is still here. First of all, we know that the Catholic religion came up on the Camino Real. We know that Spanish came up on the Camino Real. We know that cuentos and dichos came on the Camino Real. Uh, some of you can quote dichos, like, al entremetido nada le va bien. Nothing goes well for he who interferes. You know that. You've taken that good Samaritan step <laughs> and uh, ended up wondering, why did I do that? You know, it all turned against me. So there's things like that. There's also, I remember uh, a person who was promoted in, in, uh, in one of the uh, distant states that, that I know, and people wonder, how did he get promoted? And all I can think of is, tanto está el burro en la iglesia que lo hacen sacristán that the jackass spent so much time in the church that they have made him the sacristan. <laughs> and so these are uh, dichos, these are phrases of wisdom. They're like what Ben Franklin put together. And there are many Ben Franklins running around the, uh, the Camino Real in that particular time. A lot of these are passed on. The Camino Real is something else. It is a dotted line, and it is a linear frontier from Mexico City to Santa Fe, or the first capital of San Juan de los Caballeros, or of San Gabriel. And so when you connect those dots, our heritage and our lore is very much tied to Chihuahua. I was um, one time uh, taken, uh, taken aback when I was at a uh, party, and a little child fell in front of me, and I picked up the child, and she had, she had scraped her, her knee. And, and uh, she, had, she was kind of like wanting to cry, and I said, no, 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 no. Sana, sana, colita de rana, si no sanas hoy, sanarás mañana, which is just a little phrase, you know, get well, get well, little frog. If you don't get well now, you'll get well tomorrow. That's why you say carpe mañana. And so uh, one of the guys came up in Chihuahua, Ciudad Chihuahua, he said, well, where did you learn that? I said, oh, it's something we say in New Mexico all the time. He goes, well, it's something we say here all the time, too. So these phrases are part of a cultural connection that we have not only with the people that remained here, who settled here, who never varied more than 100 miles off of the Camino Real or, or anything like that. But the Camino Real established itself as a linear frontier with its own culture, with its own language, with its own uh, way of doing things. It's different from what happens off the Camino Real. It's different from what happens in Saltillo, for example, or what happens in, in, um, in Hermosillo on the Sonora side. Uh, what happens on the Camino Real becomes entrenched as a long cultural line of uh, passages of ideas, of thought, of technology. And the technology of the period brings us to Camino Real today. You see, when you had an Indian trail, you could walk wherever you wanted to. You could negotiate uh, a ford in a river. You knew where the fords of the river were going to be. You knew where you could cross. You knew that you were going to follow the lowest point on the land. Uh, however, when you brought in a horse, the horse wasn't necessarily going to go where the footwalker goes. Uh, the footpath was one path. Then we have a horse path. It becomes a little bit different. 
Then you introduce the carreta. Now you know the carreta is not going to follow the Plano del Rio. It's not going to follow the basic line of the muddy river banks. You have to move it back a little bit. And when you move it back, then you start to have a corridor of the Camino Real. And when you have a corridor, it might be five miles wide, it might be, in some cases, 10 miles wide of how it's going to trespass. Then someone gets the idea to invent an automobile. And you figure, whoa, we can't go where the carreta went, but we can make it go somewhere else. And lo and behold, you have 285, you have a Sledder Boulevard, and you have to pave it. So you have a corridor of the Camino Real de Terra Adentro, which stretches between here and the river. Uh, the trail itself uh, represents not only a corridor of, of uh, topography, it, rep it represents a settlement area. So the settlement area is very, very important for us to look at as we take a look at the Camino Real de Terra Adentro. People always start our history sometimes with the Pueblo Revolt. They started with, um, with Juan de Oñate, and they move forward, and all of a sudden the Pueblo Revolt hits, and we get knocked out for 12 years. Well, not everybody, but some Hispanic families actually stayed, stayed behind. But when they come back, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new different negotiation with the Pueblos. It's a whole new arrangement. And the whole new arrangement uh, ends up like this. Everyone recognizes that the Pueblos are farmers and the Hispanos are farmers. Everyone recognizes the need for recognizing land and territory. So the land grants become very, very important. Few people realize that there were 14 land grants in the Albuquerque area. It is carpeted from the Rio Grande to the mountain. Uh, years ago, when Sandia Pueblo had its issue uh, with what it owned, uh, they said, well, you guys only own to the foothills, but the land grant says to the Sierra. And the Sierra itself means a serrated part of the mountaintop. However, a compromise was made between the politicos and the, and the Pueblos and everybody else to okay, the federal government will take care of the mountain, no building on it, you guys can do your, your doings on the mountain. But the uh, Sandia Pueblo land grant uh, can continue to make use of the mountain, but it only goes to the foothills. Uh, if one had taken a look uh, at definition and how it was interpreted, say, uh, in the 1730s and 40s, mine would have, one might have looked at it dif differently. The 14 land grants are bordered, one by Esleta, Sandia Pueblo, Zia, and also Isleta Pueblo on the south. That means that Albuquerque cannot grow any further than that on a north-south basis. The mountain and the foothill uh, kind of precludes any more expansion uh, to, to the face of the mountain. And then we have the Rio Puerco that we keep looking at from time to time, but wonder how we're gonna have water on it. So the Camino Real uh, initiated a series. It spawned a series of changes in this particular valley which is extremely important for us to understand. Now, the families that came on the Camino Real are still here. Now, someone says the Gutierrez Hubble House. I think that's great, except that when I was growing up, and I know my parents did, and this is uh, my parents in the 1950s knew a lot of the Hubbles, but they were not known as the Hubbles. They were known as Los Obles. And so we saw oh, uh, Carl Oble. <laughs> and so, uh, Carl spoke Spanish. The thing about this, which escapes the eye, is that the Hubbles, or Los Obles, are actually culturally Hispanic. They have the one Anglo guy who came, and that sets up the genetic code. But the rest of the gene genetic code is Hispanic. And this is what happens in New Mexico. We have to define, what is Hispanidad? What does to be Hispanic mean? Well, it could be part Indian. It could even be part black. It could be part Anglo. It could be an Anglo who married into a family who all of a sudden, like James Hubble, uh, acculturizes into the family itself. I'm sure he spoke a little Spanish. But we focus on Hubble from Connecticut. I don't know why. And I get the picture that Carl came here and built his house on this land. Uh, and then you get the story. You go to the exhibit area and you start to pick up something different. Uh, you pick up the idea that, that, um, that Hubble, James Hubble, uh, married Juliana or Julianita um, and Gutierrez, who was the daughter of uh, Juan Nepomuceno Gutierrez, and the uh, and the mother, her mother was Barbara Chavez. What connection is there between Camino Real and past heritage between that little family that I just mentioned? I'm just mentioning three people here. The thing is that the Chavez's 
The uh, Durrani Chavez family is big. The Sanchez family is big. The Gutierrez family is big. Uh, the Martinez family. All these families are all part of the early founding of, of New Mexico. They expand all the way from San Juan de los Caballeros, which is San Juan Pueblo, all the way south uh, to Socorro. Uh, and the, the settlements and the patterns are there. Before the Pueblo Revolt, there were settlements already here in this valley. There were corrales or corrals. There were, there were uh, estancias, people who were breeding mules or, or raising cattle. Uh, they were just uh, small farmers just eking out an existence. And therein begins the, the notion of after the Pueblo Revolt, when these families come back, they want a little better legal understanding of what they own. And so the land grant picture comes into the story. The uh, land grants from Corrales uh, to Alameda uh, to, um, to Los Ranchos, which are still here, to Atrisco, which just recently gave up uh, its, uh, its hold in the area, to Los Padillas, uh, to, um, to Pajarito, and several other places even across the, the river, which, uh, which forms the Barrela area as well, uh, which forms all the way to the airport in, in many cases. You have a carpeted area of settlement uh, and you have a, a, a pass-through area of when people come up the Camino Real, it's not just that they were just fed here at the Hubble House, they were fed up and down the whole, the whole track. Now something changes uh, in 1820 uh, with the um, independence from Spain by Mexico. And in 1821, a lone rider with a, uh, with a, as a courier came up with, uh, with a bag full of mail uh, to give to the governor in Santa Fe telling him that Spain no longer exists. And so to me, that meant that the Camino Real is no longer Real. It was only Real as long as you had a king. And so uh, what, uh, what happens is that the name stays. The name stays because it was a local name. The local name uh, has many, many uh, pieces to it. The uh, Camino of to Chihuahua from here, because people in Albuquerque and Santa Fe traded in Ciudad Chihuahua, that was known as El Camino, the segment was known as El Camino de Chihuahua. Now the people in Chihuahua who were trading up turned around and said, no, that's El Camino de Nuevo Mexico. <laughs> so it has two names, back and forth. And you have segments all the way down, Chihuahua to Aguas Calientes and all that sort of thing. The Camino Real becomes segmented. The Camino Real in, in its segmented ways still holds the line of culture, still holds the language, still holds pretty much together the, uh, the religious establishment that was made, even though things are changing in the modern day. We have, with the Camino Real, a shared heritage with Mexico. Our national story in that way is tied with Mexico's national story. When we did, uh, my office did the original congressional study for the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. It was based on documentation, but it was based at first on the fact that the United States was only going to commemorate 404 miles of the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro from the Texas border to San Juan de los Caballeros because that was our jurisdiction, that was our sovereignty. So the United States Congress moved forward with our initial study uh, which moved the Camino Real, designated as the Camino Real National Historic Trail. Now, I was very happy with that because what that meant is that our history now is tied to our national story. Uh, it's no longer a loose confederation of storytelling of uh, Spain and Mexico. It's now definitely recognized as part of our national story. That not only includes the Hispanic settlements, it includes the Pueblos as well because they're tied to the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. We did the study in another way too. We worked with the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia and we extended that study all the way down to Mexico City and the Mexicans then uh, said, why are we doing this? We hate colonial history. And so we had to sell them on the idea that we don't blame you. Uh, and colonialism is one of those things, whether it's English, French, or German, or Dutch colonialism. Uh, it's all superimposed sovereignty and it's all exploitation. But here's the deal. It's part of your national story and it explains how the towns were established and how the people got there and it's part of your heritage. So in 2010, 2011, we worked with them for 10 years to establish symposia in Mexico along the Camino Real in Aguas Calientes, Zacatecas, Durango, uh, you name the town, we were there. And we did symposium in the United States. Every other year we did one in the U.S., one in Mexico. 
Finally, we got Mexican legislators to agree that it was part of the national story. It was part of a binational story. It was something that uh, needed to be handled. So they went to the World Heritage, and in 2011, I attended the inauguration of the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro National, I'm sorry, World Monument Site in Mexico City. So there's no reason why we can't extend this to the world, to the world site as well. We just have to make the connection with Mexico, and we can probably sell a world monument site as the Camino Real for, for the upper part. The trail is 1,500 miles long. 1,500 miles. Can you imagine our ancestors walking 1,500 miles to get here? Por qué? Why? Uh, then they get here and they, what is there? You know. But there was land. There was this type of beauty. There was a chance to start over again. There was opportunity. And they transplanted a whole new colony long before England uh, was, in Ma was at uh, Chesapeake Bay, long before England was in Massachusetts or New England, uh, long before any other settlement had taken place even among the French. So that the Camino Real de Terra Dentro is unique, it's only. Now it brings us to the Hubbles, Los Obles, I should say. Uh, they, uh, the, James comes from Connecticut, you can read all that in there. And uh, he at first is involved in the Mexican War, he's just a soldier, and um, somehow he learns about New Mexico. He and his brothers, Sidney and Charles, come to New Mexico as traders. They're part of the Santa Fe Chihuahua trail trade. And so I like the idea that, uh, that those, oh, those were the Hubbles, I say at that time they were the Hubbles. Uh, they uh, established themselves as part of the trade. Uh, Sidney, Sidney, in the long run, becomes a lawyer and he becomes a judge in the Territorial Supreme Court here in New Mexico. The Camino Real has that particular link to the state legislature. Under Spain, the Camino Real established uh, one of the institutions that was moved up was government. You had a governor and you had a cabildo. The cabildo on the Camino Real was the town meeting place. When's the first time you hear that? New England? Chapter one of your US history book. The English established the town meeting house in 1620, 1607 at Jamestown. 1598 in New Mexico, the Cabildo elected and appointed, same, same deal. You had to be 21, you had to be a male, all that sort of stuff. And so the, the government of the, of, the, uh, of the state legislature is unique in New Mexico. Uh, it's unique on the Camino Real uh, because if you take a look at what happened in Texas, the capital was San Antonio. It was moved away from the Mexican power to Austin. Arizona, the capital was Tucson, Tucson as we like to call it. It was moved to that prefab town of Phoenix to get it away from the Mexican power. First it was moved to Prescott. In California, it was moved from Monterrey to way out there somewhere in Sacramento. <laughs> Move it away from the power, concentrated power. In New Mexico, uh, they tried it at first, they thought Las Vegas is, oh no, there's too many of those guys in Las Vegas, just keep it there in Santa Fe. Here's the unique part. From the Cabildo, from the Spanish Cabildo, to under Mexico, the Ayuntamiento de Santa Fe, which is the territorial uh, legislature for the Mexican period, to the state territorial period under the United States, to the Roundhouse, it has only moved, what, eight or ten blocks. That's an amazing part. The Camino Real has that unique feature to it. And so, government is established. Now, this ties in with the, with, the, with the Hubbles because they do become prominent in New Mexico politics. They become very prominent as people who are in the Supreme Court. Uh, they become lawyers, they become sheriffs, uh, law enforcement people. They're very much involved. But, but you have to know this too, that when James uh, came to New Mexico as a trader, and he and his brothers were traders, they found one thing uh, that they fell in love with. They found women that they loved and they married and they stayed. Now, you know James um, uh, married in, into the Gutierrez family in 1849. So in 1849, who is the Gutierrez family? Uh, and uh, and uh, who is um, Juliana, Julianita or Juliana? Juliana happens to be part of the Chavez family. Her grandfather was Francisco Javier Chavez. Francisco Javier Chavez was the first elected Mexican governor under Mexico after Spain was kicked out of New Mexico. 
And, um, and he was married to Maria Josefa Padilla. So this brings the Padillas into the story. Uh, and uh, they, they become uh, a, a very powerful family. Now you have to know this, that Francisco himself, uh, who is governor of New Mexico, under Mexico, is a traitor on the Santa Fe Trail. He and his brothers and his sons were all traitors for many, many years. They were extremely wealthy. Uh, their houses were, were luxurious, uh, even, by, even by today's standards almost, because they had the most modern furniture, they had carpeting, uh, they had the best of the best in, in every situation. They were landowners, uh, and they were powerful politicians. And the, uh, the son, I believe one of them is Mariano, he's interim governor in 1833 and 1844. There's another uh, relative who is um, Jose Antonio Chavez, and I don't know how exactly how he's related, but Jose Antonio Chavez is one who initiates an expedition to leave Santa Fe by way of Abiquiu up toward Farmington, uh, up toward uh, Col Western Colorado, and across to Kanab, Utah, across Utah, over to the, Se the, the uh, Sevilla River, uh, and then down to Colorado, across the Mojave, and made the first connection with Los Angeles. As a result of, uh, of Governor Chavez's uh, innovative approach to extending the frontier. This connection brought new business to New Mexico who traded sheep, mules, horses to the Californios and also New Mexico blankets. And in doing the research for the study for Congress on the Old Spanish Trail, as it came to be known, I found that these blankets were being traded in Hawaii. So that there is a huge extension of the Camino Real de Terra Dentro, which we don't always see, and that doesn't always meet the eye. Now, you have to look at this. My father died when I was 11, and so I'm a Sanchez, right? On the face of it, you say, ah, there's Jose Sanchez standing up there lecturing. But really, in my psyche, I'm a Martinez, because my mother was a Martinez. We were raised with the lore of the land grant of Tierra Amarilla. She was from Tierra Amarilla. And so we spoke 17th century Spanish in, in the family, and uh, we enjoyed everything that the Martinez's had. I kind of lost track a little bit every now and then uh, with the Sanchez's, but uh, we still, I know that there's something like over 400 related Sanchez's in the city of Albuquerque. Uh, that's individuals, and I'm not counting their extensions of 10 other people times 10. But if you take a look at, at this, Juliana's kids were Hispanic culturally Hispanic. The mother determines what, what the child is going to be. So when we mentioned Los Obles, we knew, and I knew that my father knew them, I knew that my mother knew them, I knew that they dealt with it. I know that in the 1930s, Lucy Oble lived in Martinez Town, and Felipe in the 1940s lived in Martinez Town. Martinez Town is still in the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. It is part of that corridor that runs uh, from, from here to there. Uh, the, the road zigzags uh, through Albuquerque. It was a high, dry road and a wet road. The wet road, it, those of you who lived in Albuquerque know that William Street was flooded every day, of, every time it rained, down by Miles Road, down by the airport. The Camino Real ran also on the Broadway side, and when it was flooded, when they couldn't get through, they came on this side. They had to find a way to get across the river to get to Old Town, to get to, uh, to Alameda, to get to Los Ranchos, to get to these other parts of, of the Camino Real. And so uh, Martinez Town sits on the edge, which is called in that segment El Camino de Bernalillo, so the road to Bernalillo. So it, uh, right now, if you guys want to make a connection, the uh, Gutierrez Hubble House people, they can connect with Frank Martinez in Old Town because he's setting up a, uh, a nice linear park with a monument dedicated to the Camino Real and the people who lived in Martinez Town and the people who are associated with any, as any aspect of the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous history of the Camino Real. It's a marvelous history of connections. Now, you know that the Hubbles, or Los Obles, had uh, 12 children, and uh, eight of them uh, survived. You know that James, uh, and I don't know if it's in the exhibit, but James, uh, one of the sons, was, uh, went to West Point, and he became a lawyer, and he practiced law, uh, helped people in Old Town, and I think he also practiced in Santa Fe, but I know largely he practiced, he practiced here in, in Albuquerque. Lorenzo Hubble uh, is part of the Hubble Trading Post, 
uh, at Ganado, uh, Arizona, and it's a National Park Service historic site. Uh, I happened to have worked there uh, as an, uh, working the interpretive planning for the Hubble House many, many years ago, uh, and did some of the inspections on, on the pointing of the, of the building when they, the building started to get round again and they had to sharpen up the blocks. Uh, the uh, the uh, Lorenzo Hubble was trilingual. He spoke Spanish, English, and Navajo. Uh, he had a brother, Charles, who was also a trader. They had, uh, I think they had something like 20, 20 some uh, trading posts in Arizona as well. The whole connection of trading posts that Hubble, Hubble had been running. His brother was killed in a robbery. Tomas Hubble became sheriff of Bernalillo County. Uh, and so there are several other, uh, other Hubbles who became sheriffs. You just have to look through the history of it. Barbara Hubble, the, one of the daughters, uh, she goes to live with Lorenzo. Uh, Louise marries a doctor, go figure. Uh, and um, you can go down the line of Felipe, uh, who, um, who was born. These, they're born here at the Hubble House. I like the idea sometimes, that sometimes as brochures say, the Hubble House was built in 1868. I says, no, Dios mio. When, whose land is this? The land belonged to the Gutierrez family. When Juliana married James, they gave her a gift of land, part of the land grant that they had been working, and the house was built on it in 1849. It's a nice little one-room shack, I guess, that they started out with. Before long, it has 19 rooms. It's completed around 1868. Now, James Hubble is a trader, and he and his brothers had something like 40 wagons. How does that compare with what Javier uh, uh, Chavez had, or, or um, Francisco Javier Chavez, or Mariano Chavez, or Jose Antonio Chavez, or Mariano Chavez? Uh, how do they connect uh, with, uh, with the Camino Real? They also had large numbers of, of uh, wagons on the, old Santa Fe, on the old Santa Fe Trail, which runs from Missouri, cuts into New Mexico, at the far northwest corner coming in from Lamar and there's other places in Colorado, coming down to Fort Union and down. So there are so many things that, that connect with the Camino Real, including the old Santa Fe Trail uh, and the old Spanish Trail. So there is a connection of the, of the Tierra Santa, as we call New Mexico, uh, forming a cross that goes uh, east, west, and north and south. In uh, the formation of the, uh, of the Hubble House, uh, Hubble himself is a very important figure. The family is very, very important in local politics. They are very, very involved uh, as, 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 uh, as the um, person I can who gave the blessing this morning said, this is, this is a family that's engaged. It automatically became engaged in politics. It became engaged in the culture. It became engaged with the idea of the Camino Real and its history. Uh, and it, it's embraced here right here at this Hubble, uh, Hubble, Gutierrez Hubble House. We have to remember the Gutierrez part of the Hubble House, because it's so easy, because Hubble's so easy to remember, but you have to remember that the Gutierrez's are part of the history of the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. They're part of New Mexico's heritage, and I think that the exhibit plan that you'll go into in the historical part that has genealogical references and the timeline is absolutely right on. I think you guys did a great job in, in the formulation of the exhibit. I think you do a lot of justice to New Mexico history. And I think it does a lot of, uh, of um, uh, good feeling and well-being for this particular area.